Hi everyone, we're live. It's Elizabeth Mathern from Cook Baxter Immigration down in our South Georgia office in Adel, Georgia. I am about halfway between Tipton and Valdosta, right off I-75. Um, I am gonna be with you today to give you some updates on immigration uh, law. There's a new um, interesting case that came out of the 11th Circuit recently regarding firearms convictions. Um, of course, we're gonna talk about the budget reconciliation and what's new regarding that and the immigration reform. I'm also gonna update you on a couple of other things that are new with USCIS, like the new partnership for social security cards um, and news about um, children born abroad to US citizens using reproductive technology. So like um, uh, babies born through in vitro, in vitro fertilization, maybe that are not um, genetically um, related to the parent or um, children that are born using other methods of reproductive technology. Okay, so um, I'm gonna update you guys on all of that. I'm excited to tell you the news that I have on the um, immigration reform. I mean, I don't know, you you guys are following the news too, so you probably have this information, but I like to be your source for the updates for that. Um, and then also, of course, I'm going to answer your questions live. So feel free to um, post questions, post hellos. How, where are you watching from? You know, I love, I love to chat with y'all. So let's jump right in and get started. Okay, so um, let's start with the most exciting most exciting piece of information is probably the budget reconciliation that may most likely include an immigration reform component. It looks like that is um, a reasonable um, possibility. The official like um, highline tip sheet that I saw says that it does include immigration. The only thing that it said though was lawful permanent resident um, path pathway uh, for, for immigrants. It didn't give details on what those categories are. But as we know, we have heard that it includes DACA uh, slash dreamers. There, um, there's an interesting theory out there that there has been a, a pretty strong push for documented dreamers. So um, as you know, for DACA, you had to prove that you didn't have any status by on XYZ date. Um, children who are here with lawful status, maybe, maybe they're on student visas or they're dependent of uh, their parents' non-immigrant visas, like they're on some sort of um, an H or something like that um, that doesn't independently have a path to citizenship. Um, but they've lived here their whole lives. They've been educated here. Many, many of these children have advanced, um, advanced educations and are working, you know, so they have a, a work permit, but they don't have a path to stay here. Um, I guess have a, a path that lets them feel that they can stay here forever, even though this is their home and this is where they've been raised. So that may be included in the, the dreamer portion, which would be huge, um, would be a huge economic boost and wonderful for so many people. Um, we, you know, there's also talk that maybe the DACA, um, there might be like an expansion on the undocumented dreamers uh, where the dates are different or maybe the ages are different. We'll, ha we'll just have to wait and see. Um, frontline workers regarding the pandemic are also um, allegedly included, as well as TPS recipients and farm workers. So what I read when it first came out about the farm workers was really, really good stuff. Um, so let's hope that that's in there. I haven't heard any additional talk about whether the three and 10 year bars would be eliminated um, or dealt with in this, but we'll see. Um, one exciting development is that it's, I heard that the Speaker of the House is bringing the House back early. They're going to cut short their break um, so that they can go ahead and work on these two major bills that the Senate passed. So if you didn't hear, 
and that everybody probably heard that the infrastructure bill was passed with some bipartisan support from the Senate over to the House. Um, the budget reconciliation was passed in the middle of the night without bipartisan, bipartisan support. So that was sent over to the Senate this week with, in the last couple of days. And so the Speaker of the House announced that they're going to come back on the 23rd of August, which is in 11 days. They're going to come back and start working on trying to pass um, both of those bills. So the Speaker announced that she wouldn't hold a vote on one without the other. And I think that's an effort to really coalesce the caucus around getting something done on this, um, which I think that they need some leadership and direction there. Um, and the president's been clear that this is what he hopes can get done. So if it gets to his desk, he'll sign it. All right. Um, hi, Alan. Let's see. I don't have my glasses on, but I think I can read that. Um, you're asking about 2022, which I think is related to DV lottery. I have no news on that. Um, I anticipate that 2022 DV lottery is going to go just fine unless we have another huge COVID crisis that starts shutting everything down again. Um, but the litigation that's being done around 20 and 21 DV lotto, I would think would give you some sort of benefit or relief um, should it come out favorably, which we anticipate it will. Um, but I did want to say on the budget reconciliation, that if they do um, come back August 23rd, we may see some modifications and some other discussions. You know, um, uh, Cinema came out and said that she thought that the numbers were too high. I think it's really interesting. Um, she was on the infrastructure team, and um, the infrastructure package was to do stuff that they would have to pay for. Um, the budget reconciliation is money that they already have that they're just chopping up how they're gonna use it. So it's interesting that she would kind of nitpick the amount of money being spent when this is in theory money that is already had and the infrastructure bill is money they have to find. So interesting um, sort of play to the public um, without much nuance there. So which I told you all before, I thought that was just kind of grandstanding, trying to maybe draw in bipartisan support to show that she's a fiscal conservative. We don't know. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully, the you know, they have to get all 50 Democrat votes um, in order to put it to the tiebreaker of the vice president for it to pass. So that's definitely a possibility. Um, I think we're, we're in good shape regarding the parliamentarian approving it um, as clean for um, it being involving the budget. All of these things would utilize money uh, to create applications and would then bring in income to the government. So we'll see. Um, okay, so I think that's all regarding the budget reconciliation. I think it's really great news that the house is cutting short their recess. So I think they're motivated to push this through, get this done, and then have it signed before um, the end of the year. And then, you know, before we start seeing the uh, campaigning for the next midterm election. All right, so a few other things. Um, let me tell you about, and feel free to post questions. Um, I know this is not, that busy of a news day um, for immigration. A couple of things, as you may know, um, USCIS started allowing people to check a box on their work permit applications to apply for a social security card if they had never had one before. And they just announced that they're going to start doing something similar with the green card application. So USCIS has expanded that program, which is um, called a partnership with the Social Security Administration. They're going to allow you to um, uh, uh, get a Social Security number if you've never had one when you adjust to green card holder or um, link the previous Social Security number that you got when you had a work permit. So I think that's, or, or some other 
some other way that you got a social security number. That's a, a streamline, seems like it's a good, a good move. It might actually make things a little bit easier for people um, and just keep the paperwork and, and time down. So that's a good move. Um, that means <laughs> that we've got a form change. So the I-485 is gonna change um, once again. So we'll see how that affects the I-485 if it if they do any other changes shifting around to the forms um, because of this change, they might utilize the opportunity. I mean, the current form is going to expire. So um, make sure if you're sending in an I-485 that you check the um, date of the form that's currently being accepted because that's probably going to change soon. All right, let's talk about um, USCIS removing barriers to U.S. citizenship for, for children born abroad using um, assisted reproductive technology. So um, it was uh, sort of like a policy change, a policy application to get into like the genetic um, and gestational details of children born abroad um, to sort of, I don't know, add an extra layer of what what birth abroad means, um, birth abroad to a U.S. citizen parent means. That is extremely personal details, and, um, it, you know, uh, it upset a lot of people. It disproportionately affected a lot of same-sex couples who were realizing the dream of having um, children, through um, assisted reproductive technology, which was a really wonderful thing in their lives, only to be hit with this um, awful reality that USCIS wouldn't recognize their children as their children for purposes of citizenship. So that's been um, really terrible for a lot of families. So USCIS announced that um, that is not going to be necessarily the case. So let's see, they said um, that this will, um, let's see, <laughs> I really like this statement, I'm gonna read it to you, from the new USCIS director, Er Jadu, who, if you don't know, um, worked for USCIS for a long time in different capacities. She's also the daughter of Mexican and Iraqi immigrants. Um, so we have positive hopes for her tenure. So she says, USCIS is taking a crucial step toward ensuring fair access and support for all families and their loved ones. We're committed to removing unnecessary barriers, promoting policies for all people as they embark on their journey to citizenship. So um, the policy update will allow non-genetic and non-gestational legal parent of a child to transmit U.S. citizenship to the child if the parent is married to the child's genetic or gestational parent at the time of the child's birth um, and the relevant jurisdiction recognizes both parents as legal parents. So um, you can sort of use your knowledge and imagination on what sort of situations this applies to. Um, but it's a very, very interesting update. I think it will be beneficial to a lot of people. All right. Um, let's see. I know that uh, a lot of people have heard that the border is just crazy, that it's overflowing. Um, there's been news about a lot of people coming out of immigration detention with COVID, who might not have gone in with COVID. There's a lot of debate about all of that. Um, and then Title 42 is still being used to return, uh, reject people at the border and return families So from the border. So um, I anticipate that we're gonna see Title 42 maybe Oh, and, you know, organizations like ACL, ACLU, et cetera, have announced that they will continue with their dedication to suing about the overbroad application of Title 42. Um, and they're going to continue to fight it. They thought that they could let their guard down with the Biden administration coming in. They thought, oh, well, they'll roll it back and they won't use it in the same way that the Trump administration has. 
but um, that <laughs> hasn't seemed to be the case. So they announced that they will continue with those lawsuits um, or start new ones if that's the case. Um, I think that if we see uh, some sort of a reform bill pass, I think we might see the softening of Title 42, potentially, but I'm afraid it just all depends on where the Democrats are sitting. You know, if they're trying to convince um, the more Republican or conservative leaning Democrats to sign on to the package, they might utilize Title 42 as a bargaining chip. Um, if, if we see it, you know, get on through the House and uh, move on towards the president's desk, we might then see Title 42 um, relaxed. Unfortunately, the idea of a strong border is always something that's come, that comes into play in these discussions regarding immigration, immigration reform, um, ability to adjust status here in the U.S. Uh, there was a really good um, video that was released recently by Vox that talks about um, the 1996 immigration reform by President Clinton, which created the three and 10 year and permanent bars um, and how that essentially like trapped people here without ways to get status. And um, that prior to that, uh, about 50% of people from Mexico who came to the U.S. to work um, went back and forth because they had permission. They had border crossing cards. They had um, temporary work visas. So they were registering with the U.S. government. They were paying taxes. Um, they were having taxes taken out of their checks, presumably. And um, with IRA IRA, which was um, around 1996, 97, the the, the 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 whole system was changed. You could be deported for ordered deported for the smallest things, including like a shoplifting um, ticket. You know, so, sometimes shoplifting is charged in a ticket. You don't even go to court. You just pay a fine. I can be an aggravated felony under immigration law because of IRA IRA. People don't realize that. Same with a ticket for um, possession of marijuana. In many jurisdictions, even back in the nineties. Marijuana was charged as a ticket. Uh, it's a nonviolent offense, you know, that can be um, a deportable across the board um, problem for people. Puts you in a really, really bad situation. Or if people entered without inspection, they may be subject to the three and 10 year bar, uh, or even if they have multiple entries and previous removal, um, a permanent bar. So people um, are essentially trapped. So this is um, why, I guess, maybe historically, uh, the Democrats have always seen, tried to posture that they're strong on the border um, and posture that they're strong on enforcement and rules um, while trying to get things done with immigration. So um, we'll see. Unfor it's an unfortunate bargaining chip or like sort of gross um, part of the sort of dance that they're doing, but um, we'll see. So that is about it for me. I don't see very many people asking questions at all today. You guys are really quiet. A lot of times I get um, even a few questions, but today's been really quiet. Um, I know you guys all must be busy today and hopefully it's super hot here in South Georgia. So hopefully you're staying cool. Um, I did want to tell you about one other it is a case um, that came out of the 11th Circuit. Oops, let me get my screens organized here. It's a very interesting case, especially coming out of the 11th Circuit. They're kind of doing, kind of like reversing themselves in a previous decision. It's very weird. But they did a um, really thorough discussion on how they analyze cases, it's incredibly complicated to know the criminal, to know the collateral impact or the impact on your immigration status of a, a conviction. It is not felonies, you know, it's simple felony, or if you get one year, super complicated analysis are now required for that determination. 
And the 11th Circuit in Simpson v. Attorney, U.S. Attorney General, which is a case they just released from the 11th Circuit, they did a really thorough sort of analysis. Hi, Aurora, I see a question. I'll be right with you. Um, and basically, they came to the, the decision that um, a conviction under Florida statute, a Florida statute, which makes it unlawful for a convicted felon to own or have in his care, possess a firearm, ammunition, et cetera, um, does not constitute a firearm offense under the INA. You would think, if you didn't know any better, that um, a conviction that's called um, possess a firearm might be a firearm offense under the international Immigration and Nationality Act, but it's super complicated analysis and the 11th Circuit says it's not. So, um, and a firearm, firearm offenses are particularly weird because they can make you um, deportable and inadmissible. I think I got that right. So if you have any convictions that you're worried about, if you're a lawful permanent resident or you want to adjust your status, um, or you wonder if you're eligible for anything in immigration court, or you want to know what's going on, um, you want to kind of analyze your criminal history, maybe, um, I think it's probably too early to start looking at it in reference to the immigration reform, because we don't know what sort of um, requirements or bars to that is going to be, because it's not even happened yet. But it's really, really important that you, if you have any criminal history whatsoever, even tickets, you never even went to court, you just paid the fine. It's really, really important that you consult with a, an immigration attorney that understands what we call crimmigration, the intersection between criminal law and immigration law. Okay. I worked as a, a public, I had the privilege of working as a criminal defense attorney for Orange County Public Defender's Office in Florida. So yes, I was a public defender. Don't start. There are good and bad attorneys in every group, right? I found my time as a public defender especially important because I had, I saw a lot of stuff, um, did a lot of work for a lot of people, had some excellent mentors and excellent training that was provided as part of my job, and also had some excellent judges that were teaching me as a new lawyer, um, really, really great advocacy and um, just different skills in the courtroom. So anyway, I'm very grateful for my time. All right, so thank you, Andres. I appreciate that compliment. All right, Aurora is asking, can I replace, can a replacement EAD be expedited? My sister lost hers and her AP is about to be approved. You can request expedited treatment. I haven't ever seen it really be that effective. Um, I, would, I would probably wanna know like how long has this even been pending? Um, if she filed it timely and, and it's been pending a long time, you might have a better shot. Um, a lot of times you need to show some sort of extreme scenario to get them to even move on an expedited request, like medical hardship, or I imagine if she's got advanced parole, maybe if it's DACA advanced parole, she might have some extreme circumstances, like um, her grandmother is going to have a surgery soon, or um, her niece is um, really, really sick and is gonna have a transplant. Something like that, I would think, you might be able to transfer that same information to USCIS and ask them to expedite the EAD. Um, I would probably start with calling the 800 number and trying to escalate it. If it, had, if it hasn't been pending for very long, I, it's worth trying. But I don't know if you're you're really going to move the ball forward. They seem to they seem to do a lot of ignoring. But um, in this world, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I wouldn't tell you not to try. You can always try. All right. Let me see. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to post them. 
I don't think I have anything else that I plan to talk to y'all about. Um, let's see. I can. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I can update you on. Let's see. What else? There's nothing else really super new in the courts. Um, stuff's still happening. Individual hearings are still happening. Um, as far as I know, there's no in-person reporting. Like for ICE check-ins, we're not back to in-person reporting. ICE is still releasing people on fry hat requests. Um, even if they have been denied before, it's worth trying. Unfortunately, with the um, people who are detained for a long time, even if they were healthy when they entered the facility, immigration um, detention centers are so bad and the food is so bad that people do develop um, chronic diseases like kidney failure, diabetes, um, things like that. They might not have uh, hypertension, that they might not have gone in with, they might develop them. So anybody who's in detention, wants to be evaluated for a fry hat, probably has already been evaluated for a fry hat, but any medical issues they're having, headaches, dizziness, um, trouble urinating, nausea, um, trouble going to the bathroom at all, um, feeling feverish, feeling weak, um, cold sweats, night sweats, any of those things can be symptomatic of, and I am not a doctor. I just dealt with a lot of people with a lot of medical issues. Um, so don't, don't take my running off of that list um, as any sort of diagnosis of any kind of medical conditions. But anybody who develops anything like that in detention needs to continually be submitting those medical requests, written down medical requests through the ICE channels, through the detention center. And what you what we always recommend if you're seeking medical attention in a facility is that you make a, you make one uh, form, you fill out one form that you submit to ICE. The other form, you fill it out exactly the same and you keep it for your records. You make sure it has a date. You make sure that it says everything that the other one says. If you can't make copies, some facilities, it's easy to make copies at the library. Some facilities, you have to wait two weeks to get the, to the, the library. You don't wanna wait for that. So just make yourself two copies and you wanna keep one for your record and submit the other one. Keep putting in those medical record, medical service requests because that makes a record that you're requesting treatment, but it also might get you to those sort of evaluations that are necessary to supplement a fry hat or release request. So, and I wanna say it doesn't necessarily matter what somebody's criminal history is for these. We've seen um, people who, you know, have really old criminal history, but serious, um, have been released because their medical conditions are also very serious. And ICE realizes that this is literally a life and death situation to keep people detained in such horrible conditions. Um, I don't know if they recognize that same way I do, but um, if you have a loved one or a family that is in that situation, make sure you pass along that information regarding the medical request. And even if they've been denied before, they may have developed a condition that puts them in a different category for a renewed request. So it's something to keep in mind. All right, let's see. Petalina has a question and I'll take this and then we'll wrap up because it's almost um, 2.30. All right, I applied for a B1, B2 in my home country since March of this year. Um, and the U.S. Embassy keeps canceling, even though our government has given them the go ahead to continue operations. One of my daughters is turning 18. October 18th is our new appointment. On October 18th, and our new appointment date is November 15th. Can you advise what I can do? Okay. Here's the question for anybody else who, who wants to see. Um, Petrolina, Pet, Petro Nina. Nina, Nina, I want to pronounce your name right. It's a beautiful name. I love the way it's spelled. So uh, I'm giving it a shot. But I think I, I'm missing a piece of information here. Okay. Um, 
it is it may be possible for you to try to expedite but you got to be careful um with a b1 b2 visa that is a non-immigrant visa so you have to have in your mind that you're not coming here to immigrate so if you if you had some sort of like reason to expedite like you almost you want to be careful that you're not like telling us cis i need to go ahead and get there so that everybody qualifies for an immigrant visa or qualifies for something else that we're trying to do because that would not be good um would result in your denial so i see that you you did request an expedited appointment and that was denied um i, I think if i knew a little bit more about what's going on i might be able to better advise you but if you have some sort of reason why you need to go to the U.S. and it's related to this child, um, sometimes maybe like a child needs medical care or needs a surgery or something, a better avenue for something like that would be a humanitarian parole. But you need the a lot of a lot of practitioners say that you need the visitor visa denied before you try the. Um, humanitarian parole so you're kind of on the right track but otherwise like if you're just coming to take your kids to Disney um, or at least that's what you're you're telling the, the embassy um, I'm not sure how you're gonna get that rolled up and I also don't really know the piece of why the child who's turning 18 needs to enter before she's 18 in order to unless you're trying yeah i need to know more here so i think the best thing for you is you need to do a consultation where you can really unpack all that's going on here um, with an immigration attorney okay so you want to see your dad you want your dad to see his grandchildren before anything happens with his cancer okay all right you know Hmm. All right. We can, I don't know. They just have so much discretion with visitor visas and they are not prioritizing those at this moment. Um, yeah, I think if you had, all right, I don't want to ask you too many questions about your dad's status or, or their granddad's status and, and your status and stuff like that. But um, I think you should do a consult. Let's see if there's any other avenues that maybe you could get in. Um, to do that really important visit or at least try to move up the appointment. I think it keeps getting canceled because they're just so backlogged with the COVID closures and everything that, and they're trying to prioritize the U.S. citizen and the um, uh, family-based petitions ahead of the visitor visas. All right, let's see. Waleed has a question. All right, Waleed, I have a B1, B2 visa. Can I apply for an E2 visa from inside the U.S.? How long does the process take? And can I later convert the E2 to a green card? Okay, Waleed, I don't do these. Um, I focus mostly on deportation defense and um, family-based and humanitarian-based. So I think the main question, I guess what you're saying is you have not... Um, accumulated any unlawful status or presence because you're you have a valid visa, visitor visa which i think you're saying you're welcome which i think you're saying you have not gone past the approved amount of time that you were given to stay here sometimes people get confused and they think they have a 10-year visitor visa they think that means that they can just stay in the u.s for 10 years no that means you have the opportunity to go back and forth for 10 years but each time you go to the border, the ICE officer, I mean, the CBP officer can give you a discretionary amount of time that you can stay in the U.S., which could be one month, it could be three months, it could be six months. Um, and that period of authorized stay is what controls. So I guess, Waleed, you're probably saying that you haven't overstayed your period of authorized stay. So it's likely that you would be eligible to apply for an E2. I can't give you much more um, in-depth explanation than that because I don't do those as regularly as some of the other attorneys in our firm. Um, so I would recommend that you give us a call and schedule a consult. Tell them you're interested in an E2. Um, and it, you know, 30 minutes, we can talk about all of your history and tell you about that process, tell you how much our attorney's fees would be based on our conversation 
I think you're going to get everything you need um, to know to make a decision from a consultation with one of our business focused um, immigration attorneys. So please feel free to give us a call. Um, all right, folks. So if you want to make a, um, an appointment with me, my number is 229-472-5775. That's in the South Georgia office. And of course, if you want to reach out to any of our, oh gosh, I think we're up to like 13 attorneys now. Um, we are, um, we are with attorneys in every, every nuanced area of immigration law. So we're a full service immigration law firm. You can also call our Atlanta office if you're, if you're interested in making an appointment with one of the other attorneys. That's 404-816-8611. And we will be happy to schedule a consultation with you. All right, folks. Well, I need to get back to work. I've done more than 30 minutes today and I've really enjoyed being with you. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. And um, thanks for <laughs> listening to me talk about um, one of my favorite things, which is politics and immigration law. So thanks a lot. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>